Well, good morning. Um, not that it's really important. My name is Larry, and I kind of got this unique uh, position, sort of this pastor in training, so to speak. And um, not that it's real important or, you know, pride or arrogance driven, but just for clarity. Um, if you have your Bible, uh, go ahead and open up to uh, Genesis chapter 2. And I'm going to bounce around a little bit. Um, I'm going to start in verse 7. And it's sort of kind of a two-part uh, sermon. Um, this is the foundation, and I got maybe another text for support. Okay, so we're going to start in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. And skip down to verse 15. <clears throat> and the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And drop down to verse 18. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And then the second half of verse 20, but Adam, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Verse 21, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And verse 24 says, for this reason... A man will leave his father and mother and will be joined to his wife and they will become one flesh. And, you know, upon reading this, you know, there seems something strange to me about verse 24. Um, and so it kind of led me to believe that, you know, this wasn't really written for Adam and Eve. This was like written for us, all right? Doesn't it seem strange to you that God would say to Adam and Eve that they to leave their father and mother. That's written there for us, all right? And so the idea is this, okay? If you want to have a hot, happening relationships, one of the first things you got to do is live your life in such a way that there is no other human relationship in any way that compares in importance to that one person, all right? That person you crawl into bed to with every night, she is the one, or he's the one. They're number one, all right? This text is not teaching that, you know, we should move away from our parents and stop returning their phone calls. But what it is teaching is this, okay? That your parents, your kids, your buddies, your girlfriends, all of those people put together, your family included, do not altogether add up to the importance of that one person, all right? They need to be everything to you. And if you fail in that relationship, you are a relational failure. All right? But God can forgive and God can heal. But listen, that relationship, people, it's the one. Okay? It's the one. Okay? This is the first thing that I want to share with you this morning, this idea of marital oneness. Okay? And he goes on to elaborate in the text, and he talks about leaving, and he talks about being joined. He says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Okay? And so the idea of join there is the strong bond. It's a cementing. It's like crazy gluing two people together. That's the idea of emotional oneness, okay? Where they share each other's feelings, where they share each other's joys, where they share each other's pains, all right? It says they shall be joined together and become one flesh, one in every way. A man and a woman are not to have two purposes. A man and a woman are not to have two life directions. A man and a woman are not to have two sets of independent dreams. They, they are to have, they're to be one in every way, okay? Oneness is the goal of marriage, all right? How many of you guys remember the show Family Feud with Richard Dawson? We surveyed 100 people, and the top five answers are on the board to this question. Name something that seems innocent but often separates marriage partners. The number five answer is this, separate ways, separate ways. Well, we have separate schedules and separate events, and so we go our separate ways, right? Ding, 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 watch out. Sounds innocent, sounds minor, right? But it's an enemy of marital oneness. Number four answer, separate interests, separate interests. Well, 
He's into this and I'm into that. Watch out. Separate interest leads to separation. Name something that seems innocent but often separates couples. The number three answer, separate vacations. Separate vacations. Honey, I really want to have fun this year on vacation. So would it be okay if you stayed home? <laughs> Listen, okay? I'm not saying it's wrong for a guy to go out on a surf trip. I'm not saying it's wrong for a gal to go over, you know, on a trip with some of her girlfriends. I'm not saying that. But listen, this is what I am saying, okay? okay? If every single opportunity you have in your leisure time and you're looking forward to doing your own thing, watch out. That's an enemy of marital oneness, okay? Number two answer. I do not understand this. You can explain it to me afterwards, okay? Separate bank accounts. Separate bank accounts. I am amazed at the number of people, the number of couples who do this. Well, I, I just can't trust her. Dude, why did you marry her, okay? This is an enemy of marital oneness, okay? I'm not saying it's wrong for a guy or girl to have a certain amount of money or an allowance that he or she can spend without accounting for it, right? But I'm not understanding this. Well, you pay this bill, and I'll pay this bill, and this is your money, and this is my money. People, that is seriously dangerous thinking, right? And it might have some sort of sick, worldly kind of wisdom to it, but it's totally contrary. It totally contradicts the biblical concept of marital oneness, and I strongly urge you to reconsider that perspective, all right? Name something that seems innocent, but actually separates a husband and a wife. The number one answer. You ready for this? Separate beds and separate bedtimes. Listen, I believe so deep down in my heart that there's something exceedingly powerful about a couple coming together at the end of the day and going to bed at the same time and laying their heads on the pillow at the same time and maybe having a moment of prayer and conversing and sharing and opening up to one another. And some of you guys are like, yeah, whatever. I, I, I can't stay up as late as she does and she doesn't have to get up as early as I do. And the women are like, yeah, he's so boring. He'd fall asleep on the couch if he didn't go to bed. Enough, okay? Enough of all that. All those feelings aside, people, get together on this, okay? Okay, guys, you ready? This is for you, man. Do these five things consistently, and it'll, it'll transform your marriage because it'll transform you, and God can work through that kind of availability. Number one, guys, listen up. Spend time with your wife. Spend time with your wife. Okay, nothing will transform your marriage like time spent working on it. And if you want to have a good marriage, if you want to have a hot happening, lump in the throat, can't wait to be with her kind of marriage, if you want to have the kind of woman that you can say to your friends, guys, I hope you get to meet my wife someday. She is amazing, this woman that God has given to me. Okay, if you want that, okay, you can have that, but it's going to take time, right? Some of you men are thinking... How much time is that going to take, all right? It's going to take a lot of time, okay? 15 minutes a day, one evening a week, one day a month, one week in a year. 15 minutes a day, okay? Just talking to your wife. Honey, how was your day? How are things going? One evening a week, going out, spending some time together, turning off your cell phone, turning off the work, all right? One day every month that's really devoted to your marriage. And maybe one week in a year, you go on retreat, Maybe you get some teaching, all right? God said in his word, it's not good for a man to be alone, right? And I've done this, all right? And you might be saying the same thing. Well, I think I might be better off alone. If you said or thought that, you're not working on your marriage, all right? And it can be all that God wants it to be. And you want to know something great about our church? I have seen firsthand the most hard-hearted couples with such immaturity and struggle between them, awful things that happen, words have been exchanged, mean things said and done. All right? Ask my wife. She'll tell you all about me. All right? But listen, <laughs> but a new day can dawn in your home. Okay? And if you don't have faith to see it, okay, I am speaking faith into your marriage right now. Your very best days are ahead of you, but it's going to take time. The things you saw in her, okay? the things you wanted in her, the things that drew you to her, they're there. All right? They're still there. Fire it up again. Draw those things out. You're like, what things? The things that funneled you to the front of the church and forced from your lips those words, I do, all right? And to be able to stand here 10, 20, 30, 40, God help us, 50 years later, and to be able to say what? I still do, all right? I still take this woman to be my lawful wedded wife, to have, to hold from this day forward for better, for worse, 
for richer, for sicker, I mean for poor and sickness and in health. And listen now, and forsaking all others, give myself only to you as long as we both shall live. That's quite a commitment you made. That's quite a commitment you made, and God heard it, right? And he hasn't forgotten it, and he'll give you the strength to keep it, but it's going to take time. Second point. Men, study your wife. Men, study your wife, okay? Study up. Study up. Everything the Bible has to say about marriage, everything the Bible has to say about women. Newsflash, women are not like men. They are different, okay? Really different, okay? And they got their own way of looking at things. They got their own set of needs. They got their own thoughts about stuff. And listen, they would love nothing more than for you to get your PhD in that particular expression of God's most awesome creation known as woman, all right? But you got to get the information. And not just knowledge from God's word, but knowledge gleaned through observation, all right? You should have these little three by five cards, right? And at the top, it should say things she doesn't like. And they should be everywhere, your pocket, your car, your house, all right? So if you don't, Here's a good starting place. Here are some things guys would know if they studied their wives. Number one, it's about the word nothing. I went through this this week. Hi, honey, what's wrong? Nothing. <laughs> Let me tell you, most categorically speaking, the word nothing does not mean nothing, okay? Nothing can mean all of the following, okay? Nothing can mean figure it out, okay? Sometimes nothing can mean I can't put my finger on it, all right? Or sometimes nothing can mean nothing to do with you. All right? Or sometimes nothing can mean try harder and I'll tell you. All right? I hate that. All right? Or worst of all, sometimes nothing can mean do I have to write it in the sky for you. All right? But what it certainly doesn't mean is nothing. Okay? <laughs> Two, women are bugged about things that guys don't even notice. My wife tells me all the time, Larry, you're so oblivious. Okay? Women are bugged about things that guys don't even notice, right? Now, if you would just study, study, study your wife, right, and watch and listen, you will see that this woman is giving you an immense amount of feedback, all right, about what she's looking for. So, men, study up, okay? Three, guilty. Romance springs from sacrifice and planning, not convenience, okay? Guys try to get romantic with convenience, and it's like, Hey, honey, I had a really good idea. Let's go to dinner tonight. And she's like, oh, really? Where are we going? Well, there's this cheap buffet down in the corner. I thought we'd slip out over there. Loser, okay? Very bad idea, all right? I'll never forget the story I heard um, from uh, Bill Hybels at Willow. All right, he told the story about wanting to bring a gift to his wife on his anniversary. He was coming home from work one day, uh, probably had a very busy day, and he was stopped at the light, all right? And there was one of these dudes selling some flowers, all right? And, I mean, that's an amazing opportunity, right? You, you just roll on your window. The flowers are right there. You pay the guy, right? He must have thought, like, I'm on easy street, right? I'm just going to go home. I'm on easy street. And when he gets home, his wife is like, where'd you get those flowers? Um, I bought them through the car window. How much did they cost? Five bucks. Loser. Okay? All right? They want you to go to the flower shop in Hilo where they cost the most money, all right? And it's like, honey, these are the flowers are the statement about what I think about you. Romance does not spring from convenience. You don't get a deal on it, and it's never on sale, all right? It comes from sacrifice and planning. I was thinking about you all week, Casey. I set this up last Tuesday, and she's like, what? You were thinking of me last Tuesday? Yes, I was, all right? <laughs> yes, I was, okay? Number four, genuine compliments are never wasted. Genuine compliments are never wasted. Honey, you look amazing today, or that outfit looks so good on you, okay? Genuine compliments never wasted. Number five, a little help goes a long way. A little help goes a long way. When was the last time you said, hey, honey, can I clean up after dinner tonight? Why don't you just go take a break? And by the way, that was an amazing meal, right? Or maybe you could even touch the vacuum or do some laundry or do some dishes. But I don't want to get carried away with this, but it's true, ladies, <laughs> right? A little help goes a long way, amen? Okay. Back to the main points. Number three, men, honor your wife. Okay? Honor your wife. It's the idea of public recognition. It's not just saying at the end of the day, you know, hey, thanks, honey, you're amazing or whatever. But listen, in front of others, public praise is the idea here. And let me just tell you, with all your kids gathered around the dinner table, all right, and to say, guys, 
Do you realize who we have in this house? This is an amazing woman. And look at the way she spends herself. And look at what she does for us. Thank God for her. All right? Or maybe sometime when her parents are in town. Right? You might just say in front of her parents, you know what, guys? I never knew. I never really knew. All right? I won the lottery with her. All right? She's been so good to me. She poured out so much. Thank you for her. Thank you for raising her the way that you did. Okay? So, guys, let me ask you two questions. Is honor due your wife? Right? Is honor due your wife? Are there some things that you can see and recognize? And I hope there is, right? Then use your speech for this good purpose and honor your wife. And some of you guys might be thinking, well, no, Larry, I'm, I'm kind of not very outgoing, not real verbal kind of guy. That's fine, right? But you don't have to say a word to walk away when a story degrading about women is being told. And your friends are like, where are you going? And you're like, bro, Easy, step back, all right? I live with the most amazing woman. I ain't going to sit around here and listen to a story that, that puts women down or treats them like an object. That honors your wife big time, big time, all right? Or you don't have to say much to give your wife $100 and say, you know what, honey, amazing family you've raised. Our kids, they love the Lord. All that you've done, I just want to give you $100. Take it, spend it on yourself, have a great day. I'll take care of everything here. You deserve it and more, but this is just a reminder, all right, to you of how much you've done. And you know what? After she picks herself off the floor, she will be so blessed by that, and you will honor your wife big time, okay? Big time. Okay. Women, your turn. Husbands need to be changed, and their wives know it. It's a good spot for any men. Okay? Husbands need to be changed and their wives know it. Okay, ladies? Your turn. Listen up. Husbands need to be changed and their wives know it. Isn't that right, men? <laughs> it's, a, it's a fact. That's a fact, all right? Now, I bet, if you were to, I bet if you were to pull Casey on the side after this and ask her, is there anything that Larry needs to work on? Are there some things that Larry can do better? She'd like, give me a pen. <laughs> give me a pen. Right? I mean, it's right there on the tip of her tongue. Right? These are the things that our family needs to work on. These are the things that my husband needs to change. These are the things that need to happen in our marriage. All right? Husbands need to change and wives know it. All right? Some of you men are like, I thought you said this was about the women. All right? It is. Okay? So ladies, listen up. Here it comes. There is something in the heart of a woman that causes her to go about changing her husband in the very way the exact way that is most destructive, all right? And you say, well, what woman would want a destructive influence on her family? And you can look at Proverbs 14.1 on your own after this, but listen. Number one, words don't work. Words don't work. Flat out, words don't work. They don't work. When a woman sees something that needs to change, what does she want to do? Right? She wants to tell her husband about it. She wants to give this huge speech. She might even want to throw a little seminar at 11 o'clock at night and repeatedly so if necessary. And she would be very willing to remind me or him every single day, somehow thinking that the problem is I forgot. All right? However, that's not the problem. And you can look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7 on your own. Right? And that's sort of this, the women's way of doing it. All right? But that's not God's way. All right? And a woman is prone to thinking that she can change things in her husband with words. But the way God wants it done is by example, without a word. All right? And that's not to say husbands and wives should not communicate. They should. And that's not to say they, should, they shouldn't talk. They need to communicate. That's one of the key ingredients to a healthy marriage. But listen, ladies, I'm not saying don't talk to your husbands. But as it relates to that little post-it note in your mind about the things that need to change, that you wish were different, okay? In your heart, you think the way to make that better is to say some stuff, right? And I'm telling you, the things you're saying to affect changing your partner are far from helping your marriage. They're hurting it. You're not building your house. You're tearing them down with your own hands with those words, all right? Some of the women are like, if I'm going to stop telling my husband stuff, you better have some scripture to back that up. I do. I came prepared. See me afterwards and I'll give them to you, right? But listen, ladies, do whatever you can to get away from those words that are tearing down your house, right? You're not building it up. You're tearing it down, all right? You're tearing it down with your own hands with those words. Now, I can't explain this part to you exactly, but there is something sinful in the nature of a woman that causes her to nag. Okay, 
And there's something sinful in the nature of a man that wants to neglect. Okay? Those two things snowball into huge problems in a marriage. Nag, neglect. More nagging, more neglect. Back and forth. And that's not going anywhere good. All right? Words can destroy a marriage. You say, well, uh, I, I, I try so hard to get my wife, my husband into talking. But it's not working, is it? All right? I've been there. Get up in the morning. Breakfast is ready. Sun is shining. Birds are singing. Beautiful day, right? You and your wife sitting at the breakfast table. Out of nowhere, your wife might say, you never spend any time with me anymore. Husband's like, what? What are you talking about? Well, you always ignore me. Always? I always ignore you. Let's think through the logic of that. I always ignore you, right? Well, I just want to be with you more. And this is how you show it? The speech you're making on a beautiful morning, the birds are singing, the sun is out, while we're having breakfast together, this doesn't make me want to be with you more. This actually makes me want to be with you less. Okay? So that even if some of you who do not obey the word, they may be one, W-O-N, without a word. Right? Husbands need to be changed. Their wives know it. But words don't work. Okay? Number two. Beauty won't last. Beauty won't last. I went to a wedding a couple years ago. Real interesting. Um, you could see the groom just enamored at the beauty of his bride. I mean, he was like just infatuated with her beauty, right? And he's like, hurry up, pastor. Get to the part where I can kiss the bride, right? And so they finally get there. And it's like you got to get a crowbar to separate these two. They're just like, mm, okay? And listen to me. There is a part of that that is so wonderful. Okay, there's a part of that that's just so wonderful. But listen, there's also a part of that that is so terrifying, all right? Because if that relationship doesn't get a better foundation than what she looks like, that future is not very bright, all right? Listen, ladies, hear me. Don't let your crowning feature, don't let your outstanding characteristic be external. Peter gives some examples. He talks about the braiding of hair. Don't let the beautiful thing about you be your jewelry or your clothing, all right? And we see this everywhere. We look at Hollywood, women trying to garner attention that way. Don't let your appearance be the thing that draws attention to you, okay? Listen, don't be mad at me. Please, just listen, okay? I've heard of women who pride themselves on very little to no makeup and never do anything with their hair, all right? Listen now, but under attention is not spirituality, right? But over-attention is not godliness either by a long shot, right? And you ought to take care of yourself, and you ought to look as good as you can, all right? I'm not saying don't do that, all right? Listen, are we clear on that? Okay? But what I am saying is this. To make your outward appearance the focus, to make your outward appearance the primary objective, to make your outward appearance the driving force in all that you do is where wisdom is lacking. Why? Because beauty won't last. Listen, ladies, listen up. Teenage girls, pay attention to this part. If you're counting on your physical beauty to keep your husband, your fiancé, your boyfriend interested in you, let me say it again. If you're counting on your physical beauty to keep your husband or your boyfriend or fiancé interested in you, if there was ever a law of diminishing returns, that's it. Okay? If there's ever a law of diminishing returns, it is it. Am I right? True or false? I'm right. Okay. If you're counting on your outward appearance or your outer beauty to influence your husband or your fiancé or for your boyfriend, it'll be fun in your 20s. It'll be fine in your 30s. It'll be fading in your 40s. And it'll be falling in your 50s, right? So you better have another plan. You better have another plan. Husband needs, husbands need to be changed. Their wives know it, but words don't work and beauty won't last, okay? So you, so you say, so what then? Ladies, listen, if you didn't hear anything I said today, remember this. What God is calling you to do to bring a positive influence to your marriage, to your husband, okay? God uses a wife's inner beauty to transform her husband. 
So that's it. Pastor's going to come and close us. Amen. That was a good word. Thank you, Larry. Let us, uh, let us pray, and, uh, and then we'll close out. Okay. Lord God, we give you thanks for the good word that was proclaimed from our pulpit today. Razor sharp, clear, confident. We are so very thankful for the truths that we hear and will affirm in our lives. In Jesus' name, we offer this time to you, God. Amen. Amen. Now, remember, it is our commitment as we've come into the new year, the new calendar year, um, this, this particular conviction, which, of course, becomes a commitment. The conviction is if we lose our congregation, if we, ta- if we preach above them, around them, lose their interest, we have single-handedly built a brick wall in front of our ability to communicate the good good news. If we use language that's uninteresting or or too academic or our our, our, our sermons are too long, we've just stacked the bricks up and eliminated the potential of God to use that good news in our lives. So Larry and myself, we've committed. That conviction has caused us to commit into this new year to do everything that we possibly can in the grace of God to communicate and proclaim the good news clearly and effectively. I think you just witnessed that firsthand. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, so one one component of that commitment has has, has become this. We used to uh, uh, offer a benediction, which is ascending into the world. We've, tr- we've, tra- we've changed that into a kind of a two-minute summary of the sermon. If you don't take anything away, remember this. And we leave you with that in the last two minutes. So Larry, Larry and I have, uh, have, are partnering in this part because he's offered you just the meat of the matter. And I get to sum it up in two minutes, okay? Now let us not forget, we are in a long series on Genesis. For because, G- because Genesis is the beginning of all things, we're reading Genesis with all that we have in the beginning of new things in the life of our community. Amen? And you're saying, well, wait, this was a sermon about marriage. Well, here we go. If you don't take away anything, remember this. God has created marital oneness. What God has created, no man, no human, no person shall separate. You see, in Genesis 1, we learned all about the control God has of all of this universe. We learned about God's love and concern for creating each individual person. And we learned that God created us for relationships with each other, but also with who? God himself. And here we shift into a new chapter, right? And God gives us an example of what that relationship looks like. And so what what Larry has done is he reminded us in so many creative and clear ways that God desires oneness for God's church. So when we ask the question, what is Kona Church of the Nazarene called to this year? It should not step outside of what Larry's sermon was. An obsession with healthy marriage, with oneness and relationship. Amen? Amen. And guys, you got just stood up and and women, you got the right? So there's all kinds of things to take away, but don't leave forgetting that God has created oneness. And we see that in Adam and Eve. And should we separate that? No. Amen. Go into the world, Kona Church of the Nazarene, multiply, find others, bless them, love your neighbors as God has loved you. Amen.